Outside of relationships, money is the most common thing I'm asked about by my clients as a professional astrologer, and for good reason. In modern society, money has become fundamental to our survival. Not only do we need it to feed and to clothe ourselves and to make sure our basic needs are met and that we have a roof over our heads, but money is the way that we exercise power and control over the world around us. It's how we get to create what we want to create, how we want to create it. In our current paradigm, money isn't just security. Money is power. Money is freedom. Money gives us the ability to manipulate our reality. And in astrology, the second house gives us the key to all of this. In this video, we're gonna unlock the secrets to understanding your second house and all of your planetary placements there. So that way you can better understand how to manage your wealth and manifest money. But before we get into that, make sure you download my free Astrology 101 Quick Reference Guide at the link down below so you can decode your second house planetary placements. I don't wanna see anyone in the comments section asking me, how how do I figure out if I have planets in the second house? This is how you figure it out. <laughs> but this is also how you can start decoding everything in your astrological blueprint through the birth chart. The link once again is down in the description below. This is a 25 page guide that covers the signs, planets, houses, aspects, rulerships, and so much more. And again, it's 100% free, so you have nothing to lose there. So let's get into the general meanings of the second house before we dive into all of the different planetary placements. So so at first glance, the second house seems pretty straightforward. It's the house of money and it's the house of possessions. But in reality, it's much more than that. The second house signifies all sorts of different things, but the central theme is money, possessions, and livelihood. So the second house represents how we earn, how we value, and how we spend our money. It's our livelihood and what we do with that livelihood. It also represents our beliefs and expectations around money. So so do we believe that we can earn money? What beliefs were instilled in us through our early childhood experience from our parents, from our elders, from the adults in our world? Do we believe that we have to work hard to earn money? Do we believe that money comes easily? Do we believe that money is scary and something to be feared? Do we think money is the root of all evil? Or do we think that it's something that is beautiful and that can flow in and out of our lives and that we can use as a force for good? This energy, th these beliefs all stem from our second house and are described by our second house and the planets that are located there. Our ethics around money are also located in the second house. So somebody who is conniving and manipulative and who steals and extorts from other people, they're gonna have a very different second house from somebody who's very kind and generous and charitable with their money, who believes that money should be used as a force for good. Money itself is not inherently good or evil, nothing is. But different people are going to utilize money to man manipulate their reality in completely different ways. And the second house gives us a clue as to what that looks like for each individual person. Are you likely to step on other people's toes to get ahead financially, or are you going to lend a helping hand? There's a big difference in how that shows up and the planets, once again, have a role in that. And because the second house shows our beliefs, our expectations, our ethics around money, all of these things, it will also show us how we save or don't save and invest our money. So our long-term investment strategies, our possessions, our assets, and the possessions and assets that earn us money, that earn us income, those are all related to the second house. You may already be aware that the fourth house represents physical property in terms of land and our home and real estate, but the second house is the money we earn from that real estate, from our land, from our home. And so that's important to make note of as well and other assets that build wealth and that accumulate money, those can be located in the second house. There's also an association with investments and the eighth house, but the second house is very important as kind of that fundamental energy because it shows us whether we're likely to invest, if we're better off doing short-term or long-term investments, and what our actual physical assets especially really look like. What do our savings accounts look like? Are we somebody who always very diligently and very um, in a disciplined way puts away like 10% of our paycheck in a savings account or in some sort of money market account every single week? 
Or are you somebody who, you know, just spends it freely and doesn't care and just thinks the money's gonna come back around and maybe for you it does. Again, the second house holds the key to that and it also holds the key to what your strategy needs to be in order to not just acquire wealth because the second house is how we earn our money and some of the best ways for us to accumulate money through what we do and what we put out there in the world, the way we make money but it's also our strategy for saving, our strategy for maintaining that wealth, utilizing those resources in the best possible way for us because that's gonna look different for each and every person. And again, the planets we're gonna talk about are gonna play a huge role in that. And speaking of the way that we deal with and utilize our money, the second house is the way that we make purchases. It represents major purchases that we make and it represents our purchasing power. It also shows shows us what we're likely to value when it comes to spending our money. Are you likely to uh, splurge on a you know, luxury vacation or an adventure across the world? Or are you more likely to splurge on something really practical? Are you likely to splurge on fancy makeup or a spa day? <laughs> All of these things can be shown in the second house. And purchases and possessions can also include basic needs like food and clothing and basic resources that we need to survive and to you know live in the world around us and so that's part of the reason why the second house gets this association with food the second house is not our eating though it's not necessarily the way that we you know go about nutrition it's not necessarily the way that we eat or our favorite foods that is more sixth house and the moon which I talk about in other videos the reason there's a jumble there is because of this 12 letter alphabet version of the signs planets and houses that's got kind of globbed together in modern astrology and unfortunately it doesn't it just doesn't work that way or I should say fortunately <laughs> it doesn't work that way because it makes it much easier to understand and much simpler when we know that the houses have nothing to do with the zodiac signs and have nothing to do with the planets they are their own system and so in this system where the second house is our safety and security that's acquired through money and possessions food can be a part of that so do we have like scarcity in our lives do we have lack and does that reflect upon our ability to take care of our basic needs that's what the second house can show us it's not going to show you if you like ice cream or not the second house shows us how we give and receive gifts are we um, more frugal are we more generous do we give willingly to charity and to um, organizations or do we keep the money to ourselves do we have money to spend on charitable giving what does that look like for you the second house and the planets are going to show you that and then finally, in a more general broad sense, the second house represents what we claim ownership over on a physical level. It's how we engage overall with the material world, with the tangible things in our lives. The first house is us and the second house is all of the things that we own and that we engage with and that we possess. Now, using derivative houses, the second house can also represent a lot of different things. It can represent your siblings' enemies and tendencies towards self-sabotage because it's the 12th from the third. It can represent your parents' friends because it's the 11th from the fourth. It can represent your children's career because it's the 10th from the fifth. It can represent your employees' beliefs because it's the ninth from the sixth, or your spouse's death because it's the eighth from the seventh, and so on and so forth. We're not going to get into all of the derivative house combinations because this video would be hours long, but I just wanted to point that out that, you know, the second house and any house can represent all sorts of different things if you're using derivative houses and house rulerships, which we'll talk about in just a second here. Now, beyond kind of the modern inter interpretations of the second house that we just covered, in Hellenistic traditional astrology, the second house, or the second place to use traditional Hellenistic terminology, is considered to be mildly malefic because it has an aversion to the ascendant. It is not making any major Ptolemaic aspects to the ascendant sign. 
It's also known as the Gate of Hades, which sounds super scary, but it's not the Gate of Hades because it's associated with death like its counterpart in the eighth house. It's the Gate of Hades because it's the last place the sun transits before its rebirth at sunrise. So the Gate out of Hades might be a better way to explain it. And while the second house is considered a bad place or a malefic house due to its aversion to the ascendant, it's typically ranked as one of the least problematic or least malefic traditional houses in terms of all of the bad places. It doesn't necessarily have the happiest, best energy, but it's not like the house of death, the house of slavery, the house of illness, the house of sorrows, right? It's the house of possessions, and that's can be hard, it can be difficult, it can be a problematic area for people, but it's not the worst of the malefic energies. And continuing on that thread of the traditional significations, when it comes to the planetary joys, there are no traditional planets that have their joy in the second house. The second house is also a succeedant house, meaning that it's associated with gains, so material gains or otherwise. In this particular case, obviously it's very material because it's the second house. Succeedant houses are associated with growth and building things up. It's the signification of something moving toward its peak energy and strength, which is represented by the angular houses, which are the first, seventh, fourth, and tenth. And as we move into the energy of the planets in the second house, in addition to the general significations of each planet, you'll want to look to the houses that each of these planets rule in your personal birth chart, meaning the planet that rules the sign that occupies the house and whole sign houses. If that planet is in your second house, it's gonna be intimately connected with second house topics and themes. An example of this would be if the ruler of your seventh house is located in your second house, money and relationships are very intertwined in your birth chart and in your life. You'll learn all about how this works and then some when you join us in the Cosmic Academy of Astrology. All of the info about the Academy is down in the link in the description below. And let's get into the planetary energies for all 10 planets in the second house. So let's start with the sun in the second house. The sun represents the soul's expression of purpose in physical reality. It's what your soul wants, needs, and craves in order to feel lit up, successful, vital, purposeful, and just overall excited about life. It's what your soul came here to experience in this incarnation, in this reality. It's the core essence of who you are. And with the sun in the second house, one of the things that you came here to experience is the material realm in all of its glory. <laughs> and so you are here to enjoy material possessions, material pleasures. You are here to learn to utilize money as a resource, as a tool, as something that can be fun, as something that can aid in your creativity and self-expression out in the world. Money is a big part of who you are, and that is completely okay. In fact, it's necessary for you to feel good. You need to have financial security. You need to have not necessarily an extravagant lifestyle, but you need to feel comfortable in order to feel successful and satisfied with your life. Also, sun in the second house people love to be generous with their resources. They love to give money to charity. They love to give money as gifts. They love to give gifts as gifts. <laughs> they share their wealth. They typically do pretty well for themselves when it comes to finances because it is such a big focal point. Unless your son, of course, is super afflicted in some way. But if it's not, and your sun is just an average sun, or it's very um, nicely elevated, maybe it's exalted in Aries, or it's in this beautiful grand trine or something, then you're here to enjoy material pleasures because you're going to have an abundance of them. <laughs> Um, and it's not because it just falls into your lap. Usually people who have sun in the second house are very smart about their resources because it is so integral to who you are and what you came here to accomplish, what you came here to achieve, what you came here to experience in this lifetime. 
And again, that part of that experience isn't just acquiring and amassing wealth. People who have the sun in the second house are typically not stingy, even if it's in Taurus, which people sometimes say can be a, you know, more stingy or hoarding sign. That's not the case with sun in the second house. You like to give. That's part of how you share yourself and share your heart with the world. And so it's a beautiful thing to have sun in the second house and to give to charity, to start a foundation, to do something philanthropic, to give to a cause that you care about. And the sun in the second house people, when they don't have that financial security, when they don't have that stability, when they don't have that cushion, that safety net, that savings, they feel very off kilter. It really depletes your vitality. Anyone when they have that situation, I shouldn't say anyone because some people do better with like living on less. Some people like to have simplicity. Some people don't need a lot and don't want a lot. And it's not that you want a lot, but you want a certain level of comfort, <laughs> a certain level of experience in the material realm. And when you don't have that level of experience, you don't feel successful. You can feel down, depleted, depressed, and lacking in energy. And so part of what you need energetically is to have beautiful possessions, to have material comfort, to make sure that you are not not just giving, 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 because you are very apt to do that, but that you're saving and investing your money, that you have assets that are bringing in additional wealth, that you're growing your wealth through making strategic investments and purchases. And this can be an energy of buying things that are a little bit extravagant, depending on the sign placement and depending on what else is going on in your second house. Um, but usually when you do that, you have the money to back it up. It's not a, a coming from a place of lack or coming from a place of debt. And then with the moon in the second house, the moon is our subjective sense of reality. It's our inner world. It's our emotional experience. It's what we need to feel safe, secure, and comfortable on that internal level. And for you, one of the things that you need to feel comfortable, safe, and secure emotionally and internally is financial security, which, you know, a lot of people feel that way. But for you, there is a deep emotional connection to your wealth, to your material possessions, to that financial stability. And when you have a lot, you feel very good. Your mood is elevated. And when you are experiencing lack, that really depletes you, that really puts you in a negative emotion state. Your mood is very tied in with what you're experiencing physically. And it's not just, you know, money coming in and money going out. It's more about the possessions you have. Like you need to have certain things in your material existence in order to feel good, to feel uh, fulfilled, to feel happy <laughs> to experience some of those more positive emotions. And for you, money is very cyclical. And so think about the moon, right? The moon waxes and the moon wanes. And what I've seen time and time again with clients who have the moon in the second house is that their money always goes through cycles. It never fully goes away, but it never fully like, um, waxes and stays there. So you'll go through cycles of abundance and cycles of less abundance and cycles of abundance and cycles of less abundance and there are a lot of emotional ups and downs that go with that, but it always comes back around full circle for you. So usually you're not without or left completely, you know, just dry unless you have something else going on in your second house or your moon is super afflicted. If that's the case, then that, you know, you might be more in that waning cycle more often than not. Or you might have, um, insecure emotional attachments to resources that cause you to make bad decisions. This is also an energy, by the way, where investing and spending comes to you in a very intuitive way. You spend based on how you feel. And so you have to be very aware of that because sometimes it's intuition, right? You know that this is the right thing to purchase. This is the right place to put your money. This is the right way to save, et cetera, et cetera. This is the right venture to, you know, uh, go into in order to acquire more resources. But your emotional state also dictates what you do with your money very much so because these things are very tied in together. So if you're in a negative emotional state, do not make any decisions about money. I mean, I think that's good advice for anyone, but for you in particular, you are very likely to make a bad decision because you are in a negative emotional state or 
the wrong decision or maybe not the best decision um, because you're going to be, you know, going through that emotional cycle. The other thing too is if you're in a highly elevated emotional state, you might be overly optimistic, you might overspend, you might overinvest, you might choose the wrong thing because you're feeling really happy and really excited. That's another thing to be aware of. So when it comes to major purchases, major investments, and major decision making, that are that's going to impact your resources people with moon in the second house need to go through the full cycle of the human emotional experience before they pull the trigger and that could mean you know spending a week thinking about it but really you should go through a whole lunar cycle because the moon and the phases of the moon are going to change and shift the way that you perceive this purchase this investment this big thing and if it is a major purchase like you you're buying you know a new car you are buying a boat you're investing investing, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in something, then you're probably going to want to do that whole month long cycle if you can. Um, the other thing that can be really good for moon in the second house people is investments that are lunar. <laughs> so investing your money in things like housing, real estate, land, property, all of those things. This is also a really great energy for giving to your family um, within reason, obviously. You don't want to loan money to family. Don't do that, especially when in the second house, people. Um, but like giving back, right? When people need it, being able to help support your family is something that would feel really good to you. Being able to provide support to families or mothers in need, being able to provide food to people that need it because that's that lunar energy. The moon is very deeply connected to food. Those are really great ways to give back. So maybe, you know, donating to a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen or a food pantry or something along those lines could be right up your alley. There's this nurturing energy of the moon. Money is nurturing. Money is support. Money is this good emotional experience. Again, unless you're... <laughs> Your moon is super wonky. Um, or if you're in that waning phase, right? And then money becomes scary and it becomes difficult for you. Just know that if you're in that phase, it comes back around for you because that moon moves in cycles. And then Mercury in your second house. Mercury in your second house is an interesting energy. You can earn a lot of money through your mental activity, through your communication, through commerce and trade, which are all mercurial things. Mercury doesn't rule money and possessions, like actual physical money and possessions, but it rules the trade, the movement, the exchange of money. So getting into industries where your money is moving around, where you're trading, where you're exchanging in some way, um, getting into the stock market, doing something where you have to use your mind and your brilliance to create and generate resources, earning money through teaching, through writing, through, um, through communicating, through blogging, through all of these different things can be wonderful for Mercury in the second house people. You approach your finances very logically in a very linear, organized fashion because your brain is very much involved. There can be a tendency, especially with certain Mercury placements, to overthink your money, to overthink your finances, to overthink your purchases, where you have to ruminate on it. You have to make lists of pros and cons and this and that before you spend even a few dollars. <laughs> For some of you, it might not be that crazy and it might just be, you know, when you have a major purchase, you have to think about it and then ask someone and then talk it through and then make a list and then make a pros list and a con list and then research and then, you know, everything you, you do with your money is usually very well researched, but that serves you. That's what you need in order to feel comfortable with your investments, in order to feel comfortable with your financial strategy and decision making. This is also a really great energy for you to be somebody who helps others work through their financial strategies and decision making because it would make you very good at those types of things. And so you'll find Mercury in the second house people in careers where they're advising people um, on their finances. And even when they're not in careers where they're advising people on their finances, they're gonna be advising people on their finances, like just on the fly in their social circle. They'll be like, hey, you know, you should invest in this cryptocurrency. You should do this thing. You should do that thing. You should protect your money legally in this sort of way. I've seen it 
a lot of times. And so, um, yeah, Mercury in the second house, people very smart when it comes to their resources, but they can tend to overthink. They can tend to worry about their money and ruminate about it. It can become a source of stress if you allow it to become a source of stress. And so there's a fine line for Mercury in the second house between being very well-researched and rational and thinking things through when it comes to money and just driving yourself crazy and letting your brain run wild. And so only you can know where that line is and I'm sure you know exactly where you are on that spectrum as, you're, as I'm describing this and sharing this with you in this video. And so there's a need to come back into balance in one form or another if you've gone too far on that um, overthinking End of things. And then there's Venus in the second house. Venus is a benefic energy and Venus in the second house is considered to be a positive thing for the most part. Venus in the second house people tend to appreciate material possessions that have a lot of beauty, that have a lot of aesthetic value, that are very positive sensory experiences. They like things that are luxurious. They like things that feel good, taste good, smell good, look good. They want it to have all of that. And so you are somebody who can overspend on luxury items and pampering and things that feel good. However, because Venus is a benefic energy, and especially if you're born at night, that Venusian energy is more powerful, you probably have the money to spend. Money is a source of comfort for you. Money is a source of pleasure. Money is a source of relaxation and joy and fun for people who have Venus in the second house. You love, 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 your things <laughs> and you love to have a lot of things that are very beautiful that have really good quality this is a great energy for investing in things like art for um, investing in partnerships with other people this is just a good synergistic energy for dealing with money overall in relationships with other people it's a coming together a merging of worlds People who have Venus in the second house also tend to be very generous. One of your love languages, probably the love language for you, is gifts. It's showing your appreciation by giving something, by making something, by sharing something with somebody else, very material, very physical. And you love, love, love to receive beautiful, luxurious, wonderful gifts in return. And so that's something that you need to communicate to your partner and that you need to understand. And also your partner needs to understand about you, right? So maybe your partner is not so comfortable with getting all of these lavish gifts. <laughs> So that's something that you might need to talk about that might be a source of stress even. Um, but for the most part, it's a beautiful thing. This can be an energy though of overspending on things that are not necessarily practical. So it's kind of overspending on things that look good, that feel good, like beautiful artwork and, you know, beautiful tapestries and beautiful furniture and like all these things that are um, nice, right? And that have that material value, but they're not necessarily pragmatic with Venus in the second house. And so that would be kind of the downfall where you could overspend and overextend yourself as a result of that placement. For Mars in the second house, Mars is traditionally considered to be a malefic planet, and especially if you are born during the day, Mars in the second house is not going to be the easiest energy for your finances. It can shut you down. It can cause you to have to say no to things. It can close off opportunities to you financially. Usually, though, you are the cause of your own problems when it comes to your money. Not always the case. You want to look to, you know, which houses are occupied by Scorpio and Aries and how those people and significations play into this whole scenario. But with Mars in the second house, um, you make very quick, rash decisions about your finances. You can be very impulsive with your spending, impulsive with your investing. There's just like a gut feeling like you know you need to do this or you know you don't need to do this when it comes to financial decision making. And that can be wonderful if that is a real gut feeling and it's not just impulsivity. And so where you fall on that spectrum is going to depend on the condition of your Mars. Like I said before, people born, born during the day 
are going to have a more difficult time with Mars in the second house. People with Mars in its detriment, in its fall position, people, like people with Mars in Cancer, for example, at its fall, they might have a more challenging time with making the right decisions with their resources. People with Mars afflicted in squares and, you know, difficult aspects with other planets versus someone who has Mars in Scorpio, where it's in a grand trine and it's in the second house. You might have an easy time with it. It's kind of like, I just know and I'm going to do it. Um, people who have Mars in the second house value the power and the ability to become independent and to do things independently that money provides for you. So money for you equates to independence and the ability to take action, to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And so money is important to you in that way. Money is a source of motivation and inspiration for you. It's where a lot of your ambitions lie. That being said, Mars is the energy of conflict, disagreement, battles, separation, and there can be a lot of conflict that comes up in your life around resources. So there's good here, but there's also some negative. With Mars in the second house, you're more likely than other people to get into financial disputes, lawsuits, disagreements, arguments about money can become commonplace, especially if your Mars is afflicted. And so this is an area where you're going to need to invest in conflict resolution skills, where you're going to need to invest in mediation, where you can't just do what you want to do when you want to do it, how you want to do it all the time, especially when other people are involved. And you will learn that through your experience with working with Mars in the second house over the course of your lifetime. And then we have Jupiter in the second house. This is considered to be a very lucky, very positive placement. However, Many people who have Jupiter in the second house wonder, well, if Jupiter is in my second house and Jupiter's supposed to be the great benefic and it's supposed to be lucky, why is there not money falling from the sky? <laughs> Usually it doesn't work that way. Um, but with Jupiter in the second house, what it does bare minimum is it protects you against the worst case scenario. It protects you against the worst types of negativity when it comes to finances. And so usually with Jupiter in the second house, you'll never be completely without. And again, this is in whole sign houses. Um, and so the way Jupiter operates in your second house is going to run on a spectrum. It depends on whether you're born during the day, which makes Jupiter much more positive, or at night, which weakens it a little bit. Is Jupiter in its uh, home? Is it in its exaltation? Is it in its fall detriment? What aspects is Jupiter making to other planets in the birth chart? What does the whole picture look like? For most people, you're not going to have just an overwhelmingly positive positive, only good Jupiter. There's going to be something going on somewhere in the middle there, but it's always a benefic energy and it always is a protective energy. And so while you might not have piles of money falling into your lap from the sky, which is a very Jupiter thing to expect in the second house too, by the way, <laughs> because Jupiter makes you lazy. <laughs> and so Jupiter brings ease. It makes it so you'll not be without and money actually flows into your life a lot more easily than you probably even realize compared to other people. If you need it, it's there. And um, when you're completely like out of resources, it'll show up through opportunities, through unexpected means, through something coming in and gracing you with the extra resources that you need. Jupiter in the second house in its highest and best expression can be wealth. It can be expansion of your resources. It can mean that you own a lot, that you possess a lot, that you have a lot, but also that you give a lot. It's another generous energy. With Jupiter in the second house, um, like I mentioned before, it can make you a little bit lazy. And so if you're not taking advantage of the opportunities. If you don't recognize the opportunities that Jupiter brings in your second house for what they are, and you're not actively doing something with that energy, with that opportunity that comes up. Like, let's say somebody says, hey, I have this really great opportunity to get in on the ground floor of this wonderful investment, of this wonderful thing that I am doing, and I would love to partner with you. And you say no to that, 
and then that opportunity goes away and that person and whatever their thing was that they created that you could invest in starts taking off, that's a missed opportunity, right? You had the opportunity that nobody else had, but you didn't take advantage of it. That's how Jupiter in the second house can work for a lot of people when Jupiter's in its detriment especially. So when Jupiter is in the sign of Virgo, when Jupiter's in the sign of Gemini, you'll often see these missed opportunities because Jupiter is providing the opportunity, but it doesn't have the support through the sign placement to actually seize the day and take advantage of the opportunity. And so you'll see that very commonly with that. Um, but if you see it for what it is, if you learn to take advantage of the opportunities, you can become very wealthy with Jupiter in the second house. And, um, you know, I've seen that happen time and time again. The other thing with Jupiter in the second house is it expands on everything in the second house. And so while it can bring money and it usually protects you against being completely without, um, and, you know, it can bring this laziness because you're used to just having what you need. And so you might just always have what you need and nothing more because you're not taking advantage of those opportunities because there's no motivation, there's no stress, there's no strain to force your hand to cause you to actually have to take action there. Um, but it also, with Jupiter in the second house, can be overspending and overextending your resources. So Jupiter is this energy of the way you value money, what you believe about money, and the way you utilize your money as a result. And so you might have a very optimistic, very free attitude about your money. And that can be beautiful. That could be wonderful if you can afford it. Um, but I have seen Jupiter in the second house people overextend and they have all of these things, but no money in the bank. And so um, they love to spend money on experiences. They love to spend money on education. They love to spend money on these kind of like extravagancies sometimes, especially with certain Jupiter placements like Jupiter and Leo is classic for this. So if you're a Cancer rising, <laughs> um, you might, you know, overspend on these extravagant kinds of things sometimes. Um, but um, there's no money actually in your bank account. And so this is one where you have to learn to not just be optimistic because you know the money will come back and it'll always be there, but to acquire and develop some discernment and some realism when it comes to your resources. So that way you have money in the background. You have money that's working for you. You have money that you're investing. You have money that you're saving. You're doing something with some of your resources, at least. It's not all just fun and games. You don't have to, especially with Jupiter in the second house. You probably don't have to, <laughs> but you should, right? And that's the energy of Jupiter in the second house. And then Saturn in the second house. Now this is my natal placement and I can tell you that it is not the easiest placement, but it's definitely not the worst thing in the entire universe. And so like the other malefic and benefic energies, Saturn's gonna run on a spectrum. If you're born during the day, Saturn's not as hard on you in the second house as it will be if you're born at night. If Saturn's in its fall detriment, um, you know, that's going to make it more difficult versus Saturn being in its home or its exaltation. Saturn being in really nice aspect with other planets can help you, whereas Saturn being in difficult placements can hurt you. And so Saturn in general is this energy that is instilled in you from childhood that shows you that you have to work hard for your money. There is a belief that money is hard earned and it's hard to earn. There's a belief in lack. There's a belief in restriction. There's not enough money to go around. This is very much the opposite of the Jupiter mindset where there's always going to be more money, <laughs> which for them, you know, that's often the case. With Saturn, money seems to be this finite resource, even though, I mean, really it is limitless. Your only limits are, you know, the limits you impose on yourself and your earnings and what you can do. But people who have this placement, they grow up with the mindset, even if they have a lot of money, even if their family is very wealthy, that money is hard earned, that money is a finite resource, that money needs to be managed and restricted and, you know, worried about. There can be a lot of fear and anxiety around money and resources, especially early on in life, but this changes with age. People with Saturn in the second house, they often 
have to learn very early on how to be responsible with managing their own money, their own resources. It could be because maybe their family wasn't so responsible. And so they have to learn to do it a different way or because they had to, um, you know, go it on their own early on because their family didn't have a lot. And so they had to learn how to earn, save, invest, manage all of that. Uh, whatever it is for you, this pays off in the long term. Um, what you'll commonly see with people who have Saturn in the second house is that they don't necessarily have a lot early on. Sometimes they do. There's other placements and other things we have to look at here. But they usually will retire with a lot of money with good resources because they're very good at saving. They're very good at budgeting. They're very good at planning ahead for the future. And they're very good at living with less. They're very frugal. And so they're good savers. They're good at maintaining the resources that they require, hoarding it away, stowing it away for the future. They're not as generous as some of the other placements. And that's where Saturn in the second house needs to live it up a little bit, lighten up a little bit. Um, you need to learn to have fun with money. Money can't just be this scary, restrictive thing, or that's the energy that you're putting behind it and it's not gonna flow into your life. This is coming from someone who has this placement, reminding you of that, <laughs> Saturn in the second house. You have to learn through hard work and through repetition <laughs> that money can be fun. Money can be enjoyable. Money is there to be utilized. It can flow out and flow back in. And this is also where you have to actively learn to be generous with your resources, to give to other people, to give to um, other charities. Giving to others is not gonna make you go broke. And so that's something that I personally exercise in my everyday life whenever I can because it just helps you to kind of open things up and to feel really good about what you're doing with your money, to have money be the source of happiness, not just for you, but for other people around you. And so that's one of the best ways to kind of work with that energy, in my opinion. Um, but there is you know, an energy of restriction. Like there's never going to be this place where you feel like money's just gonna come in on its own and you don't have to work for it because you probably do have to work for it with Saturn in the second house. It's a belief that's instilled upon you through your early experience, but it's also a reality where people who have Saturn in the second house, they work really hard for their resources. And, um, but again, later on in life, that's gonna pay off. In retirement, you're going to have a lifestyle and a certain sense of security that other people just simply won't have. And I've seen that with a lot of my um, older clients. And so it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> Money's never going to feel fun to you. <laughs> There's always going to be a little bit of fear there. There's always going to be this energy of hard work, but it will pay off and you can learn to work with it instead of struggling against it. Uranus in the second house. This is an interesting one because you'll find with Uranus in the second house that money just comes to you in very unexpected and weird ways. And the best way to earn your money is through doing very odd, outside of the box, eccentric types of things. Anything that is different, anything that is outside of the norm is gonna be the best way to earn money, the best way to invest money. Also looking at things like technology, so investing in technology or utilizing technology to generate resources. Things like cryptocurrency can be interesting for people with Uranus in the second house, especially with certain you know other placements being involved. But the main thing with Uranus is that money comes in in these like unexpected ways just in the nick of time and also money goes out in very unexpected and odd ways you'll have the weirdest stories of the craziest circumstances where you lost like twenty thousand dollars in just like the most bizarre fashion <laughs> However, you'll also have stories where maybe you gained $30,000, again, in just the weirdest thing that nobody else has this experience but you. You also are very good at coming up with kind of maverick, unusual, unique ways of generating income. And you like to spend your money on very weird things that other people are just like, I don't get it, but okay, whatever. <laughs> it's your money, do what you want. <laughs> Um, this is also having a very rebellious, outside-of-the-box attitude about money. Money for you is freedom. 
Freedom and money are one and the same. Sovereignty and freedom, that is what money creates for you. And you want your money to be your money, to be independent in some way. You don't want it to be connected to the system. You don't want to make it, you know, through, through working from the man. <laughs> And so you'll find a lot of people who have very rebellious attitudes about their resources and money in general who have Uranus in the second house. I also have this placement in addition to my Saturn. And so I do have kind of a weird combination of energies that are very traditional and very um, reserved about resources and very unusual in the way that I deal with it too. And so you can have more than one energy in your second house, but that Uranian energy it tends to need to, it tends to indicate that you need to do things differently. The way that you invest your money is going to be your own thing. You came up with it on your own. You figured it out separately. It's not what that expert told you to do. It's what you decided and figured out and no one else has to understand it. It just has to work, right? As long as it's bringing in money, as long as it's making you money, as long as what you're spending your money on is making you happy and it's exciting for you. Great. That's all you need. Neptune in the second house. Now this one is challenging. Neptune is challenging for all things that are physical. It's one of the most challenging energies for health and medical astrology. And it's one of the most challenging energies for wealth in financial astrology because it dissolves the material realm. And the second house is the material realm. It's material possessions. It's everything that is tangible that you can touch, taste, and smell that you own, that you buy. And for you, money is this nebulous thing. It just flows through your fingertips and dissolves. It's like the second you have money, it just disintegrates and where did it go, right? It usually flows in whenever you need it. So usually what I've noticed with Neptune in the second house people is that money will show up sort of magically, energetically. You'll call in the money. It'll be there when you need it. But when you don't need it, it's not there. <laughs> and so it's very hard to save money and to deal with money in a tangible fashion when you have Neptune in the second house. This is a great energy for um, working for a charitable organization, a nonprofit, for giving money. This is one of the most compassionate energies around money and resources and giving. Like you feel really deeply, um, like a lot of compassion, a lot of empathy for people who don't have resources. And so even though you yourself may not be flush with cash, when you have money, you do like to give. And it's not just generosity, like the son in the second house where you're giving gifts and you're just you know, um, you're at the restaurant and you're paying for everyone's dinner. It's more like this person needs it and I can feel that and I know how it feels and I want to help that person who is down and out and in distress. That is the energy of Neptune in the second house and that can be a beautiful thing. Neptune in the second house um, needs to cultivate like a spiritual connection to money. So doing different types of visualization, money manifestation techniques, having this correspondence between the material and actual tangible things and your spiritual practice and your spirituality can go a long way. Seeing money as a tool that can aid in your spiritual development, that can be a really great way to utilize your resources and to allow it to come in. But money is hard for you to understand. It's this abstract concept. It's very, um, intangible for something that can be so tangible and so material it's hard to pin down because i mean it's really it's just a concept right it's not really a real thing it's something that we've all agreed upon we've all agreed that this you know piece of paper has a certain meaning or these numbers in the bank account on the computer have a certain value a certain meaning and then we use that value to do things to buy things, to own things. And it's not, it's not tangible in the way that most people feel it is. And you understand that, which makes it so you don't understand it. <laughs> and so again, looking at money more as an energetic exchange, as opposed to a physical tangible thing can do wonders for Neptune in the second house people. And that's usually how you end up looking at money anyway. Um, and so that is Neptune. And finally, last but certainly not least, Pluto in the second house. Pluto in the second house can be money manifestors. Like if you know exactly what you desire when it comes to your material financial situation, and it is 
truly and deeply connected to the core of who you are and what you came here to experience and achieve, you will draw that experience in like a magnet. You're very good at manifesting the money that you need for the things that you truly and deeply desire at that core level, at your essence. However, you can push money away in just the same way. If it's not truly aligned with your truth, with your core, then you're going to just repel it. And so you have to be very careful around your psychology around money around your beliefs around money, around what you say, around your energy around money, because you have the ability to draw it in, but you also have the ability to really, really repel it. And um, you're gonna be more likely to draw it in if obviously Pluto is nicely aspected, it's all, you know, it trines and wonderful things in your second house versus Pluto in a giant grand cross, right? That's gonna make it a little bit more challenging. Um, Pluto in the second house can indicate power and control issues around money. To you, money is power. You understand that. Money gives you power. Money is power. Money and power are interlinked with one another. And you understand that and you know how to wield that power when you have it. That can lead, though, to power struggles and issues that can become very psychologically taxing around money. There's a lot of intensity around money. Um, this is something that, you know, you can end up becoming obsessive over or laser focused on when you have Pluto in the second house. Uh, it can be to your benefit. You know, you can gain a lot through that, but it can also be to your detriment. It just kind of depends on how you're utilizing that energy. I've seen a lot of very wealthy, very um, like extreme wealth, like Pluto moves in extremes. I've seen extreme wealth with money in the second house and sometimes extreme poverty. Usually it'll be extreme wealth though. Pluto does have this weird correspondence and connection to money, I think because Pluto does have that signification of being connected to um, power on that psychological and energetic and psychic level. Like Pluto is psychic power. Mars is physical power. Pluto is psychic power. And money is very tied in with that, right? This is also an energy where you can do a lot when it comes to like magic with money. So uh, people who do like different spells, different forms of witchcraft, different forms of, you know, whatever type of work that you're doing around money. Um, magic and money can go hand in hand. There can also be different occult practices and rituals around possessions and money that can work really well for uh, Pluto in the second house people and that you might feel really drawn to and really gravitate toward. Um, this is also an interesting one for like the way that you spend money because you like to have like a lot of things that are very symbolic. So you'll see people with uh, Pluto in the second house who have like all of this like occult symbolism and all of these like actual like talismans and items of power that they purchase that are physical, that they hold in their hands, that they have in their environment. Not necessarily for money manifestation, but just in general. Um, not always the case. Obviously, you'd have to be inclined in that realm, um, but you know you will see that as as a signification. Pluto in the second house, people can be really good at investing their money um, and knowing who to trust and where to put their money. They're very precise. They're very well researched. They know the truth of something before they put their money into it, um, and they're very easily able to read the financial situation. <laughs> and so it makes them very good at partnering up or investing or any of those types of things. I have seen though, and um, hopefully this is none of you, <laughs> I have seen some very manipulative energy with certain clients and certain people who have Pluto in the second house. This can indicate that you are very good at reading and understanding people's financial situation and psychologically understanding how to get money from others. This can be, this is a huge responsibility, right? And this can be a power that you can use for good or it can be a power that you can use for evil. I'm hoping as you're watching this that you're using it for good and I trust that you are because my audience is amazing and I love you guys. Um, but that is Pluto in the second house.
Thank you so much for watching this video. Comment below and let me know which planets you have in the second house and how that lines up with your experience. And if you want to learn more about money and wealth and everything else about the second house in your birth chart, make sure you check out this video floating around somewhere, probably right here, <laughs> because this is going to tell you all about the second house when it comes to the sign that occupies your second house and your second house ruler, the planet that rules the second house and its placement in your birth chart. You're going to get so much more nuance and so much more detail about your wealth, about your money situation when you pair this video you just watched with that video up there. So thank you again for watching. Share this with a friend if you feel like they could benefit from what I just shared with you today. Make sure you like this video, comment, subscribe, all the things, and I will see you in the next one. Bye everyone.